Well, good evening, everybody. And uh, boy, a, a boisterous and happy crowd. It must be the spring weather outside. Finally, in uh, Washington, D.C., we're getting some nice weather. Uh, the, wine helps too. <laughs> the wine helps too. And uh, General Perna brought us some good Huntsville weather up here. So, uh, hey, uh, I'm Guy Swan. I'm the Vice President for Education here at uh, the Association of the United States Army. I've got my two uh, Vice President counterparts here, Lieutenant General Pat McQuistian, another great logistician, and uh, retired Sergeant Major of the Army, Ken Preston. And on behalf of all of us, uh, we want to extend uh, General Ham's uh, welcome to you. He's taken a few days of uh, welcome leave before we head down to Huntsville and uh, do, do other things here. Uh, you're in the Gordon R. Sullivan uh, conference and event center. If you uh, have not been uh, told about that, we uh, remodeled this building about two years ago. Uh, this uh, room gets a lot of activity. Uh, two days ago, we had a, a one-day symposium in here on air and missile defense. Uh, General Ham, I'm going to steal his uh, thunder here, but right outside in the lobby, there's a plaque with the great General Gordon Sullivan's face on it. And uh, as uh, uh, the folklore goes, if you rub his chin, that's good luck for you. So uh, please, uh, please stop by the plaque on your way out and uh, pay your respects to General Sullivan. Um, this, uh, this evening is one of two uh, lecture series that we host here at AUSA. Uh, this is the General Bernard Rogers uh, Strategic Issues Forum. And historically, this has been a... Uh, uh, an evening event where we bring in a senior uh, strategic leader uh, from the Army or from any, many, any service, frankly, or uh, even some of our government officials uh, to talk about things kind of at the, at the strategic level, as you would expect. Our second uh, series is the General Lyman Lemnitzer Lecture Series, which uh, is a bit more eclectic. Uh, that's often book authors and others that... Uh, have some interesting things for uh, an, an AUSA audience. So tonight we're, uh, we're at the strategic level, and uh, we, we are just uh, thrilled uh, to have General Gus Perna here. Uh, I'm going to just take a minute not to go through everything in your program, but I did want to highlight a couple of things before I ask uh, General Perna to say a few words for us. But uh, he assumed the duties as the 19th uh, commanding General of the U.S. Army Materiel Command uh, headquartered down at uh, Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville uh, back in September of 2016. So going on three years now and, uh, and maybe more, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, in this role, uh, he is, in fact, the Army's senior logistician and chief sustainment officer. And I would go as far as to say uh, he does that for the entire Department of Defense. Uh, once you uh, get your arms around what Army Materiel Command uh, does, it, it extends far beyond the U.S. Army, and I know he'll talk about that. The command is one of the largest uh, in the Army, over 126,000 uh, military personnel, government civilians, and contractors who impact all 50 states in some way, shape, or form and have a presence in over 150 countries worldwide. It is truly a worldwide command. Uh, before becoming the AMC commander, General Perna uh, served as uh, the Deputy Chief of Staff G4 Army uh, in, on the Army staff as the Army's G4, uh, overseeing uh, policy issues and procedures for Army logistics worldwide. He's uh, commanded numerous commands. Uh, it's, it's surprising how many times he's commanded uh, soldiers uh, in the United States Army, including the Joint Munitions Command, uh, the Defense Logistics Agencies, uh, Defense Supply Center in Philadelphia, probably the largest uh, uh, entity of its kind in DLA. And I know uh, uh, General Williams is here somewhere. There he is, General Williams from DLA. Uh, commanded at the brigade level and at the battalion level in combat uh, in Iraq. Um, I crossed paths briefly with uh, General Perna as I was leaving uh, Baghdad, and, and he was coming in as the J-4 for uh, U.S. forces in Iraq at, the, at that point, moving towards the culmination of the uh, Iraqi Freedom Mission. 
The bottom line is uh, General Gus Perna is a world-class logistician, and I'm, I'm very pleased to see so many logisticians in the audience tonight uh, to come and listen to his words. Um, let, me, let me digress for just a minute on his background. He is a graduate of Valley Forge uh, Military Academy. He may talk about that. He usually does. Uh, uh, has a bachelor's de degree from the University of Maryland. He was a, a distinguished military graduate from the ROTC, commissioned in the infantry uh, upon commissioning, and then made the turn into logistics later in his career. Uh, he's very proud of that, uh, of his uh, ROTC upbringing, and has spoken several times for us at the AUSA annual meeting at the ROTC luncheon there, one of the greatest events at the annual meeting having all those young people in, and in fact is going to speak again for us at the ROTC lunch here in about two weeks when we uh, head down to uh, Huntsville for the uh, AUSA Global Force Symposium and Exposition. So I, I don't want to delay uh, what's going to be a great evening. We will pass a microphone around for questions uh, when the general finishes his remarks, but please join me in a warm welcome for General Gus Perna. So uh, I, I didn't know about the General Sullivan plaque. Um, I'm just uh, feeling pretty good that you didn't ask us to kiss it on the way out. <laughs> I, I will probably touch it. Because... So, uh, sir, thanks so much for that great introduction. Uh, it's always an honor to be here, uh, to be a part of this, uh, and hopefully uh, just reflect for a moment on all that we're doing. Uh, and AUSA does a great job of helping us get the word out. So. Thanks to General Ham and thanks for your introduction. Um, I'd also uh, would like to say thanks to Sergeant Major Preston, right, uh, Sergeant Major of the Army, all of his leadership and all that you do. Thank you. And then Honorable Estrevez is here, uh, a little bit of a surprise to me, uh, and my XO and aide will hear about that later, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm not surprised, and sir, it's great to see you. To all the generals that are here today, and several of you, um, uh, I hope that you realize that all those things that were said to, about me uh, were because of you, several key uh, leaders in this organization, or here today. Uh, and I am humbled by your uh, presence, and, and I just want to say thank you for all that you did for me. Uh, because tr trust me, I wouldn't be here without you. So uh, it's not lost on me today uh, that today is the 14th of March. And so if you see me flinch or look behind me, uh, it's because I am a little bit of a historian and I understand what happens to generals giving speeches on the Ides of March. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> I checked the back room and it's clear right now, so all's good. So, so to all the general officers, the senior executives, the soldiers, and the Department of Defense civilians, uh, and most importantly, our great industry partners that are here today. Uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, events like this, as I said earlier, help us talk about what we are doing. It helps us illuminate the things that we're working on, the priorities that we've been given, that we are driving to succeed in, uh, and where we need help and assistance. Uh, they are made to uh, let you hear our thoughts and then ask us, uh, you know, uh, how you can help or how we can engage you better. So I look forward to the questions uh, at the end of the session. Before I start talking about the subject that I really would like to talk about tonight, which will be uh, multi-domain operations um, and the strategic support area inside of that and the role uh, that I think is going to come forth, uh, I just want to make sure that uh, the partners here, our industry partners here, that they know they have access to me, right? Uh, and what I would encourage you, because I actually, uh, when I talk to many of you, you say to me, sir, I can't get into your office. Uh, and then I usually share this big giant spreadsheet that says you're number 97 on the list. Uh, and they said, when do you think that's gonna happen? I said, somewhere around 2020. Um, but I take a lot of phone calls. Uh, and I really would uh, uh, encourage phone calls and uh, conversation uh, as we go through things. I see you in AUSA, uh, I see you in other venues, but my phone is always available and it's really easier 
to have a 10 minute phone call than an office call where I got to bring a lawyer, a contracting officer, a business developer in the office. If you just call me, we'll talk frankly uh, and we'll go from there. So thanks for being here. So on to my main subject. Many of you are familiar with Clausewitz, uh, and you know in the book on war, he wrote the following, or you should know. The activities characteristic of war may be split into two main categories, those that are merely preparations for war and war proper. Think about that. Or I'll translate it uh, through my New Jersey filter. My translation, the Army has two purposes, prepare for war and execute war. That, that is pretty simple. Prepare for war and execute war. As we develop multi-domain operations, our new doctrine, not yet approved, for those of you who are writing things down, uh, and we're working our way through it, our future doctrine of the Army, one of the key areas in it will be the, the design, designing of the strategic support area. Inside of the strategic support area, I see abundance of requirements, and I'd like to review those with you today. But first, I want to tell you what our doctrine says, or our current doctrine as we draft it and move forward, says, multi-domain operations, the concept defines strategic support area as a space where friendly strategic and national forces gain their combat power, project combat power, and sustain operations into the oper operational and tactical areas. Simply said, this is where the Army's military might will be generated, where we will project ourselves to the war, and where we will sustain ourselves throughout the war. And I believe the strategic support area will be a viable part of our future success in any war. With this in mind, I've directed seven focus areas. They're primarily the focus areas that I've given as the commander of Army Materiel Command. But I see the reach extended beyond the command, not only in command and control, but through influence to organize ourselves to develop the strategic support area. The seven areas I will go through. First, installation readiness. While our installations are our first and foremost home for soldiers and families, they're responsible to house and train our soldiers. The Army's epicenter to all that we do. The readiness of our installations are not where they need to be. And our readiness will di directly correlate to their ability to train and project to war. We need to work on infrastructure. We need to identify the capabilities that we want there, and we need to ensure that the ranges are the best that can possibly be available. Adapting our posts and camps and stations to operate and compete in the future war is a challenge. No longer can it be considered just an installation. It must and it has to be a part of the entire process. We must review and optimize our installations to what we require. We have to have the best facilities that are capable of housing and training our leaders and our soldiers. We must have the capabilities to maintain our equipment, and we must have the ranges to press them into the hardest situations possible. Second, soldier and family readiness. The health and safety and welfare of our soldiers and their families is the utmost importance to our Army. The readiness of our Army depends on the readiness of our soldiers and the welfare of our family. We must maximize those services that help our soldiers and their families. We must ensure that, uh, that capabilities like the Army Community Service is viable to support and take care of our families and ensure that our best housing is available. And I know when I answer questions that uh, that'll be a question for me in the, in the near future. We must find better ways to reduce overhead because we have to understand that our resources will be prioritized. First, the readiness, second, the modernization. But we have an equal responsibility to our soldiers and our families. 
And I think we can do it. We just have to do it smartly through the prioritization of the right funding. Third, industrial base readiness. This is about our arsenals, our depots, and our ammunition plants. We must have the best capability, not only for today, today's readiness of equipment that we have in our inventory, but also for our future inventory, the equipment that we will bring in in 20 and 30 years. We must establish that capability today for the future. We must have the right facilities and the right equipment. We must ensure that we have the right workforce, artisan capability. We, as General Bai used to say, are, is the insurance policy for our Army. Today, we work on thousands of pieces of equipment and we return them to our force. The equipment that we provide the force provides confidence to our soldiers. It is the best equipment the world has known. And their capability, their execution of mission, allows our soldiers to go onto the battlefield knowing that their equipment will withstand the enemy's best and that they can maneuver and defeat the enemy. The OIB must be resourced properly, though. It takes money today to resource the capabilities that we'll need for the future. And then it needs consistent and predictable funding into the future. There is no one and done with this capability. These organizations have been around since the early 40s. They will be around for many years to come. We must invest in them and then ensure that they are ready to execute the future mission. Number four, munitions readiness. This means having the right munitions, small caliber, to precision mission, munitions where, where we need them at the right time and the right place. That means we must first ensure that the capability we have here in CONUS can receive, store, and issue munitions in a timely, effective manner. We must do this through redesign of the depots so that they can receive, store, and issue efficiently. And we are already reorganizing that capability to that end. We have designated the distribution uh, capabilities out of each of the depots. We know where they're going to distribute ammunition when the time comes, and we know what they have to replace in time of war. This is the first time this has been done, and I'm very proud of where we're at. With that said, we have a lot of work to do. We have executed a lot of demil of old, unserviceable munitions. But as all of you can imagine, it doesn't really uh, bode well when I'm arguing to demill munitions because of the cost. But at the end of the argument, I always say, do you want me to have the munitions ready for the fight, or do you want me to hold on to the old, unserviceable munitions? And at the end of the day, that carries, uh, and we are better for that. We have a lot of work to do to redesign and reorganize this capability. But I would tell you that we're getting great support from the National Guard and the Reserve. The National Guard and Reserve are spending their AT summers. They're lined up to support us. They're executing uh, moves around the country as we relocate ammunition to the best places. Uh, so it's a huge partnership. Uh, we're getting uh, experts uh, to help us move the ammunition. We're getting great training for our soldiers. Uh, and it is making a difference strategically as we position ammunition where it needs to be. Uh, last, in that area, we are moving munitions forward. We are positioning them in countries outside of the United States. It is a matter of physics. The requirement versus the time to get it there. You all know this. So, the Secretary and the Chief have given me permission. I've moved it around the world. We put it in place in support of the COCOMs. And we know the requirement and we know how to backfill them as, as they use it. More importantly, we know how it's going to be used in case of war, and we've already planned the echeloning of munitions accordingly. Number five, the strategic power projection readiness. This is our ability to rapidly project our forces to, to the need. What has changed in the last 17 years significantly? The change is we're a CONUS-based army. A CONUS-based army must be able to get 
to, their, uh, to war in a rapid manner. The capability to project from our airfields via roads, railheads, to the airfields and to our, depo or to our ports is essential, both inside of installations and outside of installations. We have to take responsibility and work our way through that. We are doing that today. We are partnering with Transcom and SDDC to work our way through that. We are modernizing our infrastructure at the ports uh, and at the airfields. We are ensuring that our pre-positioned stock is ready to go around the world. We have established our pre-positioned stock to be configured for combat. We understand the requirement for this capability. It is not something that we have for training. It is something that will be used in the time of war. And so what we have done is we have manned the pre-positioned stock. So what used to take 17 C-17s to deliver a BCT to it now takes seven. Our goal is one. We're on our way. We have repaired over 9,000 containers and distributed them around the Army. That is in addition to the containers already there. Why? Because containers need to be where soldiers need to load out. They don't need to be in a storage yard. So we have fixed them and pushed them into the motor pools at the installations where the soldiers are going to deploy. We have expanded use of alternate ports, both in this country and in foreign countries. What I mean by that is we are exercising them on a daily basis. We are executing over 50 brigade movements a year now. That means we're moving them to airhead, to airfields and ports, and they're deploying around the world. And not only are we exercising here in CONUS, but we're exercising in the continent of Europe and in Korea and in other locations. Why? Because we need to understand. We have not deployed our Army, soldiers, and equipment simultaneously since 2003. Think about that. We have re realigned the rail cars here in CONUS so that they are matched against installations and depots so that when it's time to do, we can. This has been great work by SDDC and Transcom. Number six, supply availability and equipment readiness. We must ensure that our soldiers have the right equipment and right material at the right time. Over the last pa past two years, we have executed 620,000 lateral transfers of equipment. 620,000 pieces. What does that translate to? Over 1,000, over 1,200 units have increased their equipment on hand status. Over 1,200. That has impacted over 26 brigades. We have another 500,000 pieces of equipment that we're moving now. And when we do that, all our units will be at the highest level of readiness. We have, we have manned and equipped two new brand, secured, uh, brand new security forces system brigades, and we're getting ready to man the other four. We have divested of 1.2 million pieces of equipment, but we have another 1.2 million pieces to go. We have increased the stockage availability of Class 9 in all of our units. We have the breadth to execute exercises. We can go train. We can deploy for training with great confidence that the repair parts will be there for the training. We can maintain the readiness of our equipment at the highest level. We're in, we're in the last stage now. We are building breadth and depth so that we can sustain ourselves over time in a large-scale combat situation. This will be big for our Army. The confidence that our soldiers have that when something breaks, the, the availability of the repair parts that will be there is special. And we are getting close to that end. We have work to do, though. We have much work. We have to continue to operationalize our execution of maintenance. It cannot be just for a training event. It must be part of our culture. Supply accountability must be part of our culture, and we're getting there. The last part, the last uh, focus area is logistics information readiness. As you know, this is, this is the management of massive amounts of data. 
This is the management of data so that we can see ourselves, so that we know how to do maintenance and supply. This is the ability to execute mission because we understand our equipment. This is how it's simply translated. In this area, we've had a great deal of effort. and We've spent a lot of money over the years. And we've had pockets of great success. The Logistics Management Program, GCSS Army, huge. But now our goal is to bring these systems together, ensure that they are integrated and synchronized, not only the logistics systems, but include GFIPS and the future of IPSA. Right? In order to do that, there only could be one person, one uh, uh, commander, my word, uh, to be responsible. And we have to bring these systems in, we have to prioritize and integrate what we want done with them to the output that we want. We must eliminate the nice-to-haves. We must hold ourselves accountable to the things we're trying to accomplish. And when we do that, we're going to have a great system in place. We are consolidating those systems now. They are all under, the, under my umbrella, supported by CASCOM and the Army G4. Uh, and this is going to be uh, very uh, good for our Army, I believe, and high adventure. So those were my seven focus areas. Uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions on any of those focus areas or anything that you'd like to talk about. I greatly appreciate all that everybody does in support of our Army, from AUSA to our industry partners. Um, and I just want to say I am personally grateful. God bless all of you. So thank you. Perna, thank you so much for that. Uh, we've Sir. heard uh, last couple of weeks especially the Army leadership talking about Night Court and all the moves they made to fund the six modernization priorities. And uh, they, they, General Milley has talked about 93 programs killed, 93 programs reduced. When asked for examples of those programs, they don't have many right now to offer, big ones. Uh, my experience is usually the tiny little programs are usually logistics programs. And so I'm Wondering how concerned you are that we have the necessary logistics items to continue to support the wonderful six modernization priorities into the future. You know, nothing, you know, the new water buffalo or whatever they are. I'm, I worry that some of those things have been lost in favor of hypersonic missiles and things like that. So thank you very much. Hey, sir, it's great to see you. And thanks for the question. Okay, so um, there, there's been, uh, you know, the saying goes that. Um, Change is the only constant. So here's what I feel very grateful to be a part of. Our chief has been very clear uh, in his priorities since the day he took over. Um, and it's readiness, it's modernization, and it's the soldiers uh, and peop uh, civilians at work and their families. Right, and then the secretary came in about roughly 18 months ago, uh, and he doubled down. Right? He said readiness, modernization, uh, soldiers, and uh, civilians and families, and he added reform, right? a reform in our approach to doing things. So uh, I would say that first and foremost. It has been the bedrock for us. Uh, I would argue that we are doing very well uh, in our efforts with readiness, uh, and it's improving every day. Uh, I would also uh, caveat that with uh, my words, uh, readiness is cumulative. In other words, we must continue to emphasize it and fund it to that uh, priority so that we continue to get better every day, right? But with that said, the Secretary and the Chief have identified their priorities in modernization, and they've been very clear on that. And they've been very clear for over the last 18 months on what their priorities are, which has been very helpful for us uh, as we work through that. It's allowed us to see what we need to focus on and hold ourselves accountable. Um, to General Spohr's, uh, Spohr's question, though, 
what is, uh, how are the logistics capabilities doing inside of those portfolios? Because there is no CFT designated for logistics units. I am the CFT lead for all logistics <laughs> units. I get briefed by all the CFTs, uh, and I am the voting member um, when, the, when the senior leaders come together on everything logistics. In the night court, um, uh, what it was was presentations up from the workforce through the general officers and SESs, through the three stars, and then into the four stars. Every program was reviewed. Every single program, all, each. It was mind-numbing. Uh, I was officially non-deployable after the 40-plus hours <laughs> that we did that. I can attest, though, to the detail and the rigor that we approached every single uh, program. We all were allowed to have our say. It was about defining the requirement. It was about talking about uh, the output. What do we expect to achieve, achieve out of it? It was a discussion, is there a better way to do it, a different contract vehicle, a different approach? Do we accept risk and, l and let the system be because we're focusing on future modernization in that area, very detailed, very um, uh, passionate conversations. Uh, and, and the Secretary and the Chief uh, spent a lot of time listening. Uh, so to your point, to your question, were there some programs cut in the logistics capability? Yes, but only those that I advocated uh, in that light. The ones that I recommended uh, to stay and required uh, they're still a part of our, of our future. Uh, just recently, we had a major victory, um, CASCOM, right? Um, many of you know Rodney Fogg, uh, and then the Transportation Commandant, Gerald Helwig, um, and Daryl Duckworth at a G8 put a presentation together about what the Army trailer strategy should be. Uh, and it was an excellent briefing, uh, and it was approved by the Secretary-in-Chief. Uh, and I'm very proud of that because I think it's going to make a huge difference in our Army. So, so, sir, thank you. I took a long way to get there, but I wanted to demonstrate the confidence uh, and the rigor uh, that went into the process. So, General Parner, what I really want to ask about is the Ariel backup material. <laughs> <laughs> I'll forego that. I think we can cover that some other time. <laughs> so your seven priorities have a bunch of risk in there. First, we have to start off with the assumption that CONUS sanctuary is no longer a sanctuary, at least from a cyber perspective, yes. if not from a kinetic perspective. You're inheriting an installation base that I know, because in my time, Lennox wouldn't give me the money for. <laughs> uh, <laughs> General Dahl used to tell me he was looking for the can of WD-40 so he could get the rail switch to work when the automated switch wouldn't work to deploy the force. Yes. The industrial base is both organic and commercial. Uh, you know, the industrial base report that uh, ANS put out uh, with the White House, I'd say was pretty accurate and actually only to get the surface. It's fragile, and in order to get that readiness, that comes in one of your later points there, while we're in competition, in a war, that industrial base cannot sustain the fight the way the yes, Raiders Forge did in 1942, say. Uh, and the cyber attacks on them will also be spectacular. The munitions industrial base, what do you say, four, four. Uh, also, I've walked through some of those plants with you, uh, also chronically fragile, uh, both on the commercial side because we haven't put money into it, and I know we are now, but it only goes so far. Again, cyber threat there. What are we going to do? Hmm. So, sir, I liked it much better when you were on this side of the fence because <laughs> you helped me with solutions instead of pointing out all the problems. Um, <laughs> no, sir, absolutely, and you know it probably better than most people in this room. With that said, I would uh, bring up a couple points. One. Um, the fact that uh, the Army is visualizing our new doctrine 
and we are putting it into play through uh, multi-domain operations. Uh, and then the identification of the strategic support area, I think, is a first really big step. Two, I think that uh, we collectively have been attacking these seven areas as individual capabilities um, because that's the way they're funded. Sometimes priority is for one over the other. Sometimes we have to spread resources to make them all sustainable over time, et cetera. Uh, and that might still be a reality going forward, uh, but I believe if we interlock them and we put them together and we demonstrate that failure in one of the areas will lead to failure in the other six areas, uh, which would eventually lead to failure uh, forward, uh, that we, have, we stand a better argument of competing for the right resources. Third. We have to uh, face reality in seeing ourselves and understanding what our current capability is, what our future requirement is, and then we have to incrementally build to the capability that, that is required. Uh, not an easy task, as you just identified, for many, many reasons. Um, with that said, I'm always uh, glass half full, uh, and we're taking on this responsibility and we're moving forward. So a lot of work to do. I, I'm going to, um, with everybody's indulgence, uh, when I get to speak uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to try to illuminate more of those, uh, our way ahead and how we're going to do that. So thanks for that, sir. Hey, sir, Mick Bednarik. Um, you highlighted the strategic support areas and a great presentation. And I know everybody in here says, you know, thanks for just coming and spending a little bit of time with us. Across the strategic framework and the landscape of the nation, you're also in support of all of the combatant commands. Uh, and a lot of the priorities directly tie to risk, as you know. In fact, you, sir, you highlighted exactly the same thing. Uh, from your lens across the strategic support areas of all the COCOMs that we support, that you support, where do you see the biggest risk of COCOMs? I think Korea is a lot of energy and uh, high profile, et cetera, but we've done a heck of a lot of work, as you well know, in the Indo-Pacific uh, AOR with uh, Abe Abrams and the team. But be interested in your perspective of where you see the uh, risk to the combatant commands. Yeah, so thanks, sir. I really appreciate that. Great question. So um, again, uh, and rightly so, um, I want to give uh, the chief has really led us uh, to where we are today. The chief uh, talked to us about operationalizing um, our, our capabilities forward, right? And so uh, underneath that intent, I felt that my responsibility uh, as the commander of AMC was to be the single point to be the orchestrator uh, of sustainment and logistics from, from CONUS uh, forward to the COCOMs. Uh, and we've worked hard on that, as you've noted. But I would tell you, uh, first, before uh, I move forward on what I think is the priority, which I'll do my best really not to answer, um, is the partnership uh, beyond AMC, uh, because it is more than just an Army fight. It'll be a joint fight uh, if we do this, uh, and it has to be throughout the services. Uh, and that's led, of course, uh, logistically by Daryl Williams, who's here tonight. So. The Defense Logistics Agency has done Herculean work, uh, as I describe what we're doing here in the future. Uh, and then second, uh, the industry partners, right, is the third leg of this stool. Uh, because as you know, a foundation of what we do is through the law cap capability. Uh, and so we couldn't get to where we need to be without it. So it, it's a, it, it's a three-legged stool. And then if I didn't if I didn't say it, I know I'd get a phone call probably as soon as I leave here. Steve Lyons would be calling me and telling me, well, what, how are you going to get there, dude? So uh, our partnership with uh, Transcom. Now, uh, what we've done and what I've done, the chief has given us clear priorities. Uh, I'm not going to discuss that here with you. Um, but I understand them and the people that work for me and the uh, partnering with us understand that. Uh, and we have executed to those priorities. And what we have done is establish capability forward to the requirement of the COCOM commander uh, in priority. Uh, and then we've built the sustainment up all the way back here to CONUS. 
And then we connected it to the distribution. Right? And then we operationalized it through the log cap capability uh, as we redesigned how we want to orchestrate uh, that contract. Uh, and as you know, more than probably other people in here, where we're at with that. So we put all that together, and that's how we're working on it. So I worked hard to avoid directly answering your question, but I know you understand why. <laughs> so. Hey, sir, Bob Lennox. Um, sir. First, I'd like to um, respond to the spurious attack from <laughs> um, uh, and you know, I recall going down the hallway with you and getting uh, wire brushed at DMAGs left and right alongside of you, Alan. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, sir, the real question is, you gave a, a, a great speech and highlighted the priorities, but I didn't hear mention anywhere in there things like AI, robotics, machine learning. Um, some of the areas, you know, logistics may benefit by those, maybe more so than on the front line of, uh, in, with infantry squads. Yeah. I, uh, cloud, things like that. Have, have you contemplated those? Are those all? So uh, I am working in partnership with Mike Murray. Mike Murray has a stick on that. He's our Futures Command Commander, as you know, uh, and he's taking the lead, and I am partnering, uh, we are partnering in many of those areas. One area, though, that we have, uh, that we've taken responsibility for is added manufacturing. And so uh, we've established a... Um, for lack of a better term, uh, Mecca up in Rock Island. Uh, we have spent quite a bit of money to buy all the machinery that we needed, additive, subtractive, et cetera, manufacturing uh, that's being put in as we speak. Uh, we've received great support from Dr. Jetty and his team with policy on additive manufacturing, uh, and we're about to publish an X order. So, and our main effort though, to be truthful with you, is not about uh, taking over the supply chain, but uh, being able to influence readiness shortfalls. So our priority of effort will be to um, the divisions uh, and repair parts that we can't get our hands on uh, that are long lead times, et cetera, and our depots uh, that can't be filled. Um, the long pole in the tent, though, I'll be honest with you, is intellectual property. Uh, and for a long time, we didn't go after intellectual property because of the cost. Um, and we've pushed hard, and we think it's necessary. We don't need to own all. We just need government access to it. And when we have that, then we can uh, complete the digital thread that we're establishing in Rock Island. Uh, and in simple terms, as you know, sir, that means we just say the part we want, stock number, the 3D drawings pop up, we can put them together, and we can distribute them. Uh, we've made a lot of progress in this. Uh, we hope to be uh, IOC by June uh, and FOC by uh, 18 months from then. So that part I'm taking responsibility for. Um, I defer to Mike Murray for the rest. Good evening, sir. Uh, Dan Fish, Michigan National Guard, CW3. Um, <clears throat> quick question about, uh, so multi considering multi-domain, in terms of log cap, how much of, our, of this operation are we going to lean on log cap for? Uh, and as a warrant, you know, we're trying to take back a lot of the ground we've lost to LARs and FSRs, which we're making, I think, good headway with, but I, I kind of don't want to see the same thing happen with log cap. I mean, we have a lot of things we need to work on, and, and that's significant, well, a significant thing that we need to have, but uh, how do we get the genie back in the bottle and mm. then use it appropriately? So uh, we are going to use it differently, and we are, in my view, uh, log cap can be used not just abroad, but here uh, to do missions, the right missions. Um, I don't see them doing maintenance and supply, if that's what you're referring to uh, in particular. There might be opportunities to, based on deployments, et cetera, but not to uh, replace or uh, alleviate the responsibility of green suitors to do that work. And you know that you've been in a room with me when I've given the pitch uh, about what warrant officers need to be taken over again. Uh, and so you know, uh, next week I have a full pitch coming in, the G4's coming in, Army Sustainment Command's coming in, uh, TACOM, AMCOM, CECOM, uh, because I have a vision for redoing our LAR and FSR uh, capabilities. Uh, I, I personally, it's my personal opinion, but I think we've hit the easy button way too fast uh, with FSRs. There's a place for them for the, at the right time for the right equipment, uh, but we've been on autopilot. 
my opinion. Uh, second, um, uh, LAR program. I have a lot of LARs that work for me. I've talked to them all, so this is not a, uh, I'm not letting the genie out of the bottle, to use your term. Uh, I told them I'm, I'm unhappy with their performance. There's pockets of excellence, um, but I'm not happy with our ability to integrate and synchronize uh, what their mission is in support of us. Uh, so we're redesigning the program. Uh, we're focused on uh, holding them accountable in a different light. Uh, and so that's being briefed to me, and we're going to implement it in the very near future uh, because I'm just not happy with it, period. And I'll be able to expand on that privately. Sir, thank you very much for being here. Um, Phyllis Wilson, and I have a question for you with regards to the Army Campaign Plan 2019 Plus and MDO. And we talk about interoperability. And with mission partner environment coming into fruition in the future, uh, when we talk about sustainment, our log plan, are there any thoughts about how do we, will we be called upon to resupply our partners in the future when we're doing MDO? Yeah, I, I think there's a great possibility for that. Uh, and I think we ought to understand that. Um, not only our responsibility in commodities, as you know, we do a lot of when we hit the battlefield, um, but I, there could be potential uh, around the world for equipment. Um, we have a very, very um, vibrant capability down at USASAC for foreign military sales. Uh, the metric used to be number of sales at the right dollar. Uh, the metric has been changed to building partner capacity. How are you building capability in support of the COCOM commanders based on their priorities? not the sales, the dollars, uh, which goes into conflict with some interests. Um, with that said, uh, I'm holding them accountability, accountable to building partner capacity. Uh, so I think there is a time and place where that might become more um, of a requirement, but I don't know when that will be. Uh, if you read Freedom's Forge, which was mentioned earlier, um, uh, Part of the book will tell you that we supplied the majority of the Allied forces with equipment uh, at the height of World War II. I, d I would suspect that might be similar in the future, as required. Hey, sir. Good evening. Dick from Mike. Um, let me add my thanks to you for coming. We look forward to seeing you in Huntsville. I really like the way you laid out your priorities. One th or there focused efforts one through seven, and it validated for me the notion of having MCOM uh, linked to AMC for readiness across the spectrum. Do you feel that you've got the authorities to be able to move resources across those priorities to your satisfaction? 100%. So uh, maybe, and I don't want to talk too much for those that don't uh, know, but so the Secretary and the Chief redesigned the way that we uh, execute or manage money uh, in presentation. So now um, General, General uh, Garrett, soon to be the Force Com Commander, is responsible for all the training dollars. Uh, General um, Murray is responsible for all the modernization dollars right, out of EEPEG. And I am responsible for all the dollars at a SS peg and II peg, which is the insulation peg. Now, as you know, better than me, sir, we are partnered with great assistant secretaries. Um, I partner with both Dr. Jetty uh, and Mr. Beeler, Dr. Jetty in SS and Mr. Beeler uh, at a, uh, uh, for II, at a IE and E. So together, we are the ones that are uh, uh, going through and defining uh, the requirements, and then aligning the monies for recommendation to the secretary and the chief. It's their, it's their dollars. They approve. Um, but in, to your question, I do greatly feel I'm empowered to uh, move monies to the places it needs to be. Uh, well, we're, we're, we're going to test that. <laughs> we're going to test that. To uh, Honorable Estevez's question, uh, and to the design of the priorities and me being between the two pegs, um, 
Uh, I'm very proud of, I don't think we stumbled our way, I not think, I know for a fact we didn't stumble our way into this current situation. The Secretary and the Chief made decisions deliberately uh, and postured me uh, with the money, uh, II and SS, along with this IMCOM to complete this capability uh, that we're looking at. Uh, so I think there's uh, lots of room to explore uh, and we'll maneuver our way through that. Uh, but I feel empowered to make the hard recommendations. <laughs> yeah, I wish I was in charge of seating because you two would have not, you two would have not been together. <laughs> this, this, this is a softball. Um, talk a little bit about where we're going with CBM. Um, are, you know, within the command, perhaps Army wide, um, what we've accomplished, what you think, in your judgment, you've been looking at this now for a lot of years, yeah. needs to be accomplished, and how do we get there? So, uh, sir, it's not quite a softball, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, we're, we are working hard. Uh, Andre Pegui, uh, I think I saw Andre was in here. Oh, thanks, Andre. Uh, and I are partnered on this, uh, and we are really trying to bring a lot of individual organization enthusiasm uh, together. Uh, for the Army, uh, and we're making some headway on that. Uh, but truthfully, we're learning more about what we're doing than we thought we knew. And I won't speak for Andre, that's me, uh, a as we bring all the pieces together uh, in our presentation. There is more organizations working on CBM than I, I didn't even imagine. But once I got my hands on the money and I started looking where the string was attached, I was shocked. Uh, and one of the things we're learning is how many people are doing CBM. So uh, our first strategy, and Dr. Jetty has supported us on this, is the policy for uh, you know, bringing it all together and the output we're trying to achieve on that. Uh, and now we're trying to uh, bring it to fruition. Um, as you know, uh, the importance will be on how do we bring the data out and then how do we use the data. Uh, and so we're working on that now. We are working. Uh, I've approved um, several OTAs to help uh, work with industry, to help see ourselves in this area. Uh, and quite frankly, <laughs> I'm waiting for some money right now because you know the timeline. Uh, but more to follow on that. So not quite a softball. Uh, it's, it's probably not as bad as I've, I'm making it sound. It's just I'm not smart enough to sit here and pull the whole string through. They have to bring crayons in. Uh, and connect the dots. And every time I get a money brief, I add another dot, and, and it makes it a little bit worse. So, to be honest with you. Condition-based maintenance. Okay, if I, I'm going to close with one because I didn't get asked the question and I was going to go there. Um, so uh, many of you saw, uh, th you know, that we have an uh, issue with our partnered housing right now in our installations. Uh, and now that IMCOM works for Army Material Command, I am the responsible commander uh, for all that housing on all the installations. So it's not only the partnered housing, but it's the government housing uh, and the barracks uh, on top of that. It's 110,000 housing units uh, and uh, countless more barrack spaces. Um, here's what I will tell you. Um, the secretary and the chief stood up and said, we are responsible for the condition of our housing areas. And we will take responsibility and we're going to move out to fix it. Uh, and they laid out very specific guidelines to the commanders. Uh, everything from executing 100% uh, town halls around the Army to 100% inspections of all of our quarters, right? To implementation of 24-hour hotlines uh, and reports on all work orders, life, health, and safety, not just for uh, uh, reporting, but for completion and completion at the right standard. Uh, so we are taking responsibility uh, in this effort. Uh, and we will uh, work our way through the solution. Our goals are to make sure that we instill 
reinstill the confidence uh, in our soldiers and their families that Army leadership is responsible and will take care of them. Uh, that is our number one goal from the Secretary and the Chief. Our number two goal is to make sure that the money that our soldiers pay, that they redeem it through the quality of the housing they live in. Uh, and that's been my mandate from the Secretary and the Chief. Uh, I will hold myself accountable to that end. The leaders of the Army are all involved, uh, and they are engaging. So uh, I thank you for allowing me to do that, General Swan. Uh, and it's been a great honor for me to be here. God bless all of you. Thanks for what you do for our Army. Army strong. Hey, before you take off, take off, just a couple of quick announcements for you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, uh, I, this is a privilege for me, not growing up as a logistician, to be surrounded by all these great logisticians. But I did want to recognize uh, Lieutenant General uh, Darrell Williams, the head of the Defense Logistics Agency, Lieutenant General Andre McGee, uh, McGee who is the uh, Army G4, and Command Sergeant Major Roger Mansker. Nothing gets done in Army Materiel Command without uh, his approval. Um, two, two, quick, uh, two quick notes on upcoming events. Uh, in this room, next Thursday, a week from tonight, uh, we'll have Colonel Retired Joe Seleski, who's going to be uh, giving a presentation on his book. It's on the back of your program on uh, the war in Laos that uh, paralleled uh, the war in Vietnam, uh, which should be a fascinating uh, discussion. And then uh, a plug, uh, we've, we've hosted General uh, uh, Perna tonight. Uh, in two weeks, he's going to host us uh, at Huntsville, 26th through 28th uh, March for the AUSA Global Force Symposium and Exposition. My uh, battle buddy, Lieutenant General McQuiston, tells us we're ahead of schedule on uh, registration. All of the exhibit space is sold out. So this makes for a very, what we believe is going to be a very popular uh, uh, forum for the association, for the Army, and for our industry partners. So again, General Perna, thank you for what you do, and thank you for coming tonight. Thank you.